Her mama told Big Maul the Jefferson Davis bus being stuck in a ditch. It's funny you know such a wide ditch in one day. I didn't even notice the beginning of it this morning. Did you children? No, and we coursed. You didn't fall in, did you? We jumped onto the bank when we thought the bus would be coming, said Stacy truthfully. Well, good for you, approved Mama. If that bus hadn't been there when I came along, I probably would have fallen in myself. The boys and I looked at each other. We hadn't thought about that. How'd you get across, Mama? Stacy asked. Somebody decided to put the board across the washout. They going to haul that bus out of there tonight, Big Ma inquired. No, ma'am, said Mama. Well, I guess that was a question. No, ma'am, said Mama. I heard that Mr. Granger telling Ted Grimes, the bus driver, that they won't be able to get it out until the rain stops and it dries up a bit. It's just too muddy now. We put our hands to our mouths to hide the happy grins. I even made a secret wish that it would rain until Christmas. Mama smiled. You know, I'm glad no one was hurt. <laughs> hurt. I'm glad nobody was hurt. Could have been too uh, with such a deep ditch. But I'm also rather glad that it happened. Mary! Big Maul exclaimed. Well, I am, Mama said defiantly, smiled smugly to herself, and looking very much like a young girl. I really am. Big Maul began to grin. You know something? I am too. <laughs> then all of us began to laugh, and we were deliciously happy. So that's a good moment, you know, uh, for the Logan family. Rolled under him, I cried. Uh, Great Faith had zero buses, and Jefferson Davis had two school buses. Most money came from the churches, and Great Faith Church just didn't have enough money for the bus for the black kids. So even though the white kids had two whole buses, the black kids had none. White kids had brand new textbooks, and the black kids did not. They had the old, you know, uh, hand-me-downs, the throwaways, and they also didn't have chalkboards or a lot of the resources. So... Like Bell Hooks, she compared her integration into the white schools, and she says when the black schools uh, was being, uh, when they were created and they were being designed, the black folks knew that the white society was trying to crush them, try to kill, you know, um, get rid of them all. So they realized that they had to educate their best and brightest. They had to graze a leadership class up, a ten percent, as W. E. B. Du Bois says, a ten percent, the talented tenth. Um, so that there would be a leadership class to be able to raise the entire uh, black people out. So it was revolutionary education because they truly wanted you to be educated, whereas the white schools only give a shit about obedience and compliance. Still today, Spalding University is a teacher training school in their so-called education. They don't teach you how to be a teacher. They teach you to shut the fuck up and to sit down. And if you don't do as they say, they'll fuck you up. That's Spalding University. I mean, that's like... You know, that's graduate school, that's above college, and that's for your master's, and they still want just blind obedience. That's all they give a shit about. So it's not education, um, it's just oppression. Uh, there's not any morals, there's no spirituality, you're not being led by your own curiosity, uh, you're not being empowered, you're not being strengthened, if anything you're being smashed into subservience, and we know that blind obedience gives us war, genocide, and slavery. That's why those things were able to exist. Uh, not all white people had slaves, but because of their blind obedience to the, the circumstances, especially during the Civil War, poor whites were willing to die just because of the perceived, you know, social um, uh, sort of uh, uh, superiority um, to, to the black folks, even though having free labor totally hurts the poor whites' uh, prospects of getting a good job that pays well. So it was, you know, slavery was totally against the interests of the poor white, but in the South they were willing to put their lives on the line for 10,000 slave owners. And that's what, you know, that's what the uh, South was fighting for. 10,000 slave owners wanted to keep slavery institution around, and, um, ha you know, over half a million people wound up dying for that. You can't put it all in the South because there's racism in the North, and George Washington had fucking slaves. He was a terrorist. He killed all the fucking Iroquois Indians. Um, you had um, Thomas Jefferson, who who says that we're all born free and equal, uh, which isn't true, right? He was, um, he was raping uh, Sally Hemings, right? He had authority. He had power over her, so that's, that's, uh, that's not a balanced, fair and balanced relationship. So... Carrying on, Mr. Morrison was a big, strong black man. He was a friend of the Logan family. Check out the movie. The movie is only about, it's it's pretty long actually, about two hours, but it's good, the whole thing, all the way through. And when you read the book, there's a tension that's there the whole way through too. So the um, he's a big, strong black man. He's a friend of the Logan family. Both of his parents were killed, as well as all of his sisters, by the night men. When Mr. Morrison was six years old, and Mr. Morrison forced himself to always remember that, Mr. Morrison explains how he got so big. 
and this goes to the uh, sort of the origin of the you know pride of black people in America. So even though it's horrible, right? Slavery is horrible. And they used to be kings and queens in Africa, and and you know then slavery really kind of brought them backwards. But during slavery, there are some farms that mated folks like animals to produce more slaves. Breeding slaves brought a lot of money for them, slave owners, especially after the government said that they couldn't bring no more slaves from Africa. They produced all kinds of slaves to sell on the, the block. And folks with enough money, white men and even free black men, could buy exactly what they wanted. My folks was bred for strength, like they folks and they grand folks before them. Didn't matter none what they thought about the idea, didn't nobody care. So it's um, they were the best and the brightest, right? So they didn't want the you know the sort of the weaker slaves. So they would actually get the stronger slaves. So Mr. Morrison was just a, a big, strong black man. So uh, you know uh, the black folks of today can take pride in in sort of being the strongest and the best. Um, you know, uh, which I don't know. Watch Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's um, it it will make you so indignant and pissed off about the the slave trade, how everybody was involved in it, and even though they said they was bred for the best, I saw this one scene where like this retarded, um, you know, the strong strong fucking male, but he was fucking retarded, um, was going to rape like this fucking this this real young fucking fourteen year old or or probably younger, and so it was just really uncomfortable and disgusting and disturbing. And, um, but that's, that's, you know, I don't know, it's whatever. So, you know, the best and the brightest, that's where they had came from. So the strongest, Mr. Morrison was big, strong man, right? So the Logan family was able to secure their land because of reconstruction. And this isn't me telling black folks to do it. I think this is something I observed that black folks say, um, we were the, we're the best and the, the you know, the strongest and the best and the uh, brightest. So the Logan family was able to secure their land because of Reconstruction. The white mass of Harlan Granger had to sell 200 acres of his land uh, in 1887 to cover his taxes. So Reconstruction actually helped the Logans get their family. This was Lincoln's plan. Reconstruction actually failed overall because the troops were removed in 1877. And then we got the nadir era of race relations. But some people did benefit, and good for them. They could use the small foothold that they were able to get and sort of get freedom for everybody. So Cassie's grandfather bought 200 acres in 1887, then another 200 acres in 1918. Harlan Granger was always trying to buy back the land, but the Logans would refuse to sell it to them because the land just meant so damn much to them. Late on the night of the last day of the revival, a storm is brewing when TJ knocks at the Logan's door. Cassie quietly lets him into the boys' room. He is badly hurt. Stacy is very suspicious. TJ explains that he went with Melvin and RJ, two white boys, to Strawberry, a city, thinking that they were going to buy him a pearl-handed pistol that he had been wanting. So TJ's a, a black kid that was walking with the Logans in the very beginning of the book, but he's kind of a bad wild kid, but he's hurt, right? And he runs to the Logan saying he needs some help. But he goes with these two white boys, uh, Melvin and R.W., to eventually rob this fucking store. So they rob the store and they injure the owners. The white boys were wearing masks, and the children resolved to help TJ to his home. But just after TJ uh, goes inside, a lynch mob drives up and begins to beat TJ up and his family. The mob thinks that TJ and some other black children were responsible for the robbery. And in fact, Melvin and R.W. were a part of the mob, right? So the two people that was responsible for killing uh, this guy, who it was sort of a racist, so we don't really miss him too much, but the robbery and the murder is going to fall on TJ's head because that's who the white people are fingering their point to him. And since the other ones were covered up in masks, they can plead ignorance. And it's going to be, you know, black folks versus a white folks word. And that sort of, you're, we don't see TJ die, but we suspect that it's going to happen. So the children resolve to help TJ to his home, but just after TJ goes inside, a lynch mob drives up and begins to beat up TJ and his family. A mob thinks that TJ and other black children were responsible for the robbery. In fact, Melvin and RW are part of the mob. Mr. Jameson arrives to break up the mob, but they threaten to continue to the Logan property and hang LT and Papa along with TJ. At this, Cass and the two younger boys rush home to warn their family while Stacy stays to see about TJ. Mr. Barnett owns the Barnett Mercantile, the shop in Strawberry. 
city that the Logans visit and that TJ and the Sims brothers rob. Mr. Barnett dies in the end from getting hit on the head by a Sims brother. Like many of the white characters in the book, Mr. Barnett's a racist, openly, gleefully racist. He interrupts his transaction with TJ several times to help out white people. And when Cassie calls him out on it, he calls her a nigger. This uh, chapter 5, paragraph 62. And he demands that she leave his shop. As if that wasn't enough, he's also dishonest. TJ tells a story of how Mr. Tatum previously had a dispute with Mr. Barnett about an order in which uh, he, Mr. Barnett, creatively added items. So basically it's a company store. The uh, sharecroppers are uh, should be just happy if they just break even when it comes to the company store because they inflate the prices, add items to their list that wasn't on it. And, um, and since they sort of control the money and control all the economics that's, you know, it's a company store. They sometimes even had script. They would offer their own money out, right? Here's money that we'll only accept. And they're dependent on, you know, getting their goods from the store. So, you know, the, the Emancipation Proclamation actually didn't get freedom. It, there's a de facto slavery was still in place for most of the black folks. So... That's Mr. Tatum, and then that's why Mr. Tatum eventually, uh, there's an argument. Uh, so, did we mention he wanted Mr. Tatum to pay for those added items that Mr. Tatum knew nothing about, and that Mr. Tatum was tarred and feathered by an angry crowd when he objected? Thanks to Mr. Barnett, we can see that racism affects every mundane aspect of everyday life, even grocery shopping. Stacy wants to know what will happen to TJ. Papa cannot lie to them or deny that TJ will probably die, falsely accused of murder and robbery, and all that he says is that it shouldn't be. The story ends with Papa going into the woods after Stacy, Cassie crying for the land and for TJ. So, TJ was a bad fucking, you know, cookie. He was shitty. Always fucking laughing at other people and jealous of other people's stuff. And he hung out with these bad white kids and eventually the bad white kids set him up. The bad white kids set him up and they um, robbed a store and they blamed blamed it on him. And um, and so we don't see him actually get lynched, but it's it's assumed. And the uh, the book in the movie actually there's there's sort of solidarity because when they were going to kill TJ, the mob had TJ, and they was going to just go ahead and take justice in their own hands before the sheriff got there. The a fire starts out in a cotton field, and then you had white people and black people all beating the fire and try to get the fire out on the cotton field, and it was in the um, Mr. Logan's farm which he intensely set the fire, so basically the fire stops this lynching from happening, um, which we don't get to see as a reader, but Papa basically, you know, they say, well, what's going to happen to TJ? It's like, well, the white people got him, the white people have him in their jail, and what's going to happen is those two white kids are going to lie, they're going to say it wasn't us, it was, you know, it was them, we heard him talking about him and him, and so they'll lie and just put it all on TJ, and since TJ was actually there, he'll try to say the white kids were involved, but... Um, it's a dirty South, right? It's a dirty, dirty racist totalitarian dictatorship. And that racist totalitarian dictatorship, the white people got democracy and had a right to vote and a right to a fair trial, but black folks didn't. And, um, and so when the kids ask their father what's going to happen to TJ, he can't lie. Even though he's falsely accused. Well, I don't know. He didn't kill the guy. It was one of the white kids that actually killed the guy. Um, but they were a part of the mob, so, you know. He says that it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And that's why, even though TJ was a shitty guy, Cassie cried for TJ <laughs> and for the land. And, and, and it still kind of gets me a bit choked up, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. So it, sh it shouldn't be. TJ should not, should not fucking die. But because of the fucking racism, um, he probably will. So that's a... Uh, uh, that's a... Uh, Roll thunder, hear my cry. All right, that only took forty-five minutes to go through. <laughs> um, but those are good scenes, and I'm glad I went through that. So, number four, Huckleberry Finn. All right, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a quintessential American novel. Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. Uh, I, I have a feeling that most people haven't even read this book because if you read the book, you see how he, he runs away from school. He doesn't want to be civilized. Um, he's just rafting on the river, right? He's um, playing hooky instead of going to school. He didn't want... Mark Twain said that his, his school interfered with his education. So uh, he actually wanted to just kind of explore, go in the woods, play on the river, and he would learn that way. That's an education for him. He would actually learn. And... Um, 
that's uh, uh, that's Huckleberry Finn. So this is a quintessential American novel about a rebellious kid who doesn't even want to go to school yet. We're here in Kentucky. We just raised the dropout race to 18. So basically, if you don't go to school, you will you know you'll go to jail. Your parents will go to jail for truancy. So that's incredible. Has nobody read Huckleberry Finn? A lot of times they try to ban it because of the N-word, but I think it's because of the lessons that we learned from it. Huckleberry Finn, he don't want to be civilized by no Christian fucking missionaries. Um, and and I'm going to go through some more of the quotes here. Let's get into the end of 15 minutes. So, yeah, I don't really see many Huckleberry Finns in. I'm wild like Huck. I don't give a fuck. And when, even when I'm down on my luck, I don't know what... I'm trying to say here. 